morning, everybody. Um, so I'm, this, this session is about uh, Grail 3 plugins and what you need to know about them. Uh, first things first, uh, my name is uh, Alvaro Sanchez. Uh, I work for the Grails team at OCI. Uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to uh, mention me. And uh, well, you know, OCI is a sponsor of the conference and also is the uh, home of Grail since uh, more than a year ago. Um, so what I'll tell you is a set of uh, tips and tricks you need to know and especially um, what is different from uh, Grails to plugins. So uh, how many of you have uh, written a Grails plugin ever? Raise your hands. Cool. And uh, out of those, uh, how many have done a Grails, Grails 3 plugin? Only three people. And one is Jeff, so he doesn't count. Um, uh, good stuff. That's why you're here, I suppose. So, um, well, the basics, how you create a Grails 3 plugin is very simple. Uh, you use the create plugin command. This is the same as before. Um, there are two ways to create a Grails plugin. You can create a plugin without saying anything, or you can specify the plugin profile. So at the, mom at the moment, there are two profiles for plugin. I'll talk to you a little bit about profiles. So a profile uh, is something which was introduced uh, first in 3.0. Uh, it was changed or improved dramatically in 3.1. And uh, essentially, a profile uh, is the way you can configure how is the uh, resulting application going to look like. So for instance, you can define uh, the resulting application uh, build.gradle file through dependencies, through build script dependencies. Uh, you can provide commands for the application that has been created. Uh, for instance, the create domain class belongs to a profile or also the runup. Uh, you can define features as well, like for instance, uh, Hibernate, uh, which will bring the Hibernate uh, plugin into the build.gradle, JSON views, etc. And finally, the skeleton, which is a set of files and folders that will uh, um, become the, the actual application. Uh, there's a difference between the two profiles. So what I told you is that there are two profiles for plugins. There is the plugin profile, uh, the web plugin profile. So essentially, if you're not doing anything with the web, web related, use the plugin profile. And take into account that the web plugin is the default one, right? So if you want the smaller one, you have to specify the plugin profile. And uh, I recommend you to, to carefully think if you actually need all those dependencies. Uh, so here's a diff uh, of the resulting application uh, build.gradle. Um, so for instance, in the web plugin profile, you have a GSP, a uh, Gradle plugin. You have a lot of dependencies like a, um, for instance, um, the uh, Spring Boot uh, actuator, uh, the Jet plugin, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing to consider is that if you want your application to be runnable, like for instance in RunUp or things like that, uh, you obviously need the web profile, right? Because uh, uh, the web profile defines, uh, no pointer, the web profile defines uh, the Spring Boot Starter Tomcat dependency, which is the one that will bring the container up, okay? Um, but maybe, uh, so this is essentially when you're creating a plugin. So if you don't need your, to run your plugin uh, as an application, uh, you normally will want the, the plugin profile because um, uh, the scenario here is that you have um, uh, the user will have an application and that application will likely be already a web application, right? So you don't need to bring again all the web dependencies. And uh, so once you've defined the starting profile uh, you, you want your plugin to, to, to be, uh, you have to trim it because there's a lot of things that comes by default and you're not gonna need them probably. So 
Uh, and this is one thing you really need to do it, right? Because uh, um, if you can start with the plugin profile whenever possible, uh, because as I said, for instance, uh, if the final application the user will have is already a web application, you don't need to bring the web dependencies again. Uh, but it's also about the skeleton. So whatever you put in the skeleton um, will be part of the of the uh, plugin created. So uh, remove everything you don't need, right? Because if you don't do that, there is a, a bot called Burbeck with. Uh, there's a bot on the internet that scans. Uh, uh, clunky plugins uh, on GitHub, and uh, if it finds uh, something you didn't clean up, it will send you a pull request automatically, right? Uh, there's people who says uh, he's a person, but uh, they're lying to you, so it is actually bots. Because, um, yeah, so he's cleaned up a lot of uh, plugins already. Uh, I took a quick look at the GitHub API, uh, and uh, over the last three months, which is where the statistics are available, uh, he sent 14 pull requests to different plugins, right? And that's only over the uh, last three months. So imagine over the several years, he's been cleaning up uh, plugins. So who here has received ever a pull request from this bot to clean up his plugins? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so probably hundreds. Uh, do it because uh, it is important to keep things as minimal as possible, right? So, for instance, if your plugin is providing a service, uh, don't leave the uh, controller folder created or don't leave anything created. So, keep everything as minimal. Uh, so, if you were going to reduce everything to the minimum version possible, what would be so? Imagine I want to create like from scratch a plugin with with uh, the bare minimum information. Uh, I want. That would be essentially a folder containing the build gradle file, uh, uh, associate main Groovy directory with the plugin descriptor, which I'll explain later, and an empty Gradle subfolder. That's the minimum things you need to create a plugin. You don't need anything else, okay? So the plugin descriptor, um, something I told you before, uh, now it's different because uh, in Rails 2, this used to be a, a script, or well, was actually class that was in the root of the plugin. But now this is different because now we have Gradle for Rails 3, so we can properly define classes in a uh, in package. So inside the uh, associate main Groovy, you will have a class which stands Rails.plugins.plugin. Uh, that class is the one that defines, for instance, a uh, do with dynamic methods, uh, do with uh, uh, web XML, things like that. All the hooks you were used to do before. So um, instead of defining um, closures like you were doing before uh, as part of that uh, script class that were in the root, now you just overwrite methods. So you have code completion, you have everything, right? Uh, the syntax is a little bit different from Rails 2. Uh, I don't have an example, but uh, the essentially the difference. Um, well, there is a, if this time I'll show you uh, a demo at the end. Uh, but the difference is that the methods are returning a closure in this time. So you'll have, like, for instance, a, um, do with dynamic methods, then br uh, braces, and the resulting type is a closure. The returning type is a closure. That's the only difference. Features. Things we can do in a plugin. Uh, regarding configuration, how do we provide configuration to the uh, resulting application? Or how can we make the application that will have our plugin um, um, configure uh, our plugin through properties? So we can provide uh, configuration values that will be exported to the uh, host Rails application. Uh, and we do that in one of plugin.yaml or plugin.groovy, but not both. Uh, so when to choose one, and by the way, this is by design. So when to choose uh, one or the other, 
Uh, essentially, choose the YAML one unless you need to specify anything in the configuration which is not uh, representable through a YAML um, file, like for instance a closure, right? So if uh, you have a configuration value that you want to be a closure or something like that, uh, like a callback or whatever, or something you want to, to execute, uh, then the only way to do that is with uh, the plugin.groupy file. But otherwise, for simple key value things, use the plugin.yaml. Uh, and those values will be uh, when the application that is installed in your plugin is uh, starting up, Grails will emerge uh, into the runtime configuration, the values coming from all the plugins, plugin.yaml or plugin.groovy. Um, that being said, you can also have configuration for when you run your plugin as an application to test it. So if your plugin is a um, web plugin, you can run up your plugin uh, for testing it, uh, which I don't recommend. I'll explain that later. But uh, if for whatever reason you're used to do that, uh, you can define configuration for that specific case in application.yaml or application.groovy. So, because in that case, your plugin is also a Grails application, and uh, it can define the YAML file or the Groovy file as any regular Grails application. Um, how do we exclude content? So, it is a typical thing you want to do, uh, that you have, for instance, a test controller, uh, or for instance, actually all the tests, you don't want to be part of the, um, the final application where the plugin is installed. Y you don't want actually to even become uh, part of the jar file generated. So the way to do it is that um, you have to do it in two uh, places. Um, in the plugin descriptor, there is a, a property called uh, plugin excludes. So uh, when you do that, uh, Grails will ignore everything in there um, when uh, searching for, uh, for artifacts. Like for instance, uh, it won't search for any controllers or any uh, services, things like that. It won't be scanned at all, it will be ignored. Um, and also, if you define uh, the same thing in the build.gradle, they won't even be part of the jar file, which is actually what you want, right? So define uh, your exclusions in, in the two places and uh, you'll, be, you'll be good. And the syntax is, um, I think it's the same in both, uh, is an and pattern sy syntax. What else? You can also define command line extensions. Um, so for instance, uh, y uh, you can use uh, the uh, create script uh, for uh, creating code generation commands. So when you do that, you will have a, a script which is runnable with the Grail CLI. Or you can use create command uh, when you want something which interact with the uh, loaded uh, spring, uh, sorry, Grails application. And those are runnable with either the Grail CLI or as a Gradle task. So for scripts, uh, when, when you create a, when you run Grails create a script, you'll have a file uh, similar to this one. This is actually a real example. Uh, this is the generator uh, script. Uh, this is part of the, um, uh, one of the profiles. But it could be a script as part of a plugin. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you think of the Spring Security Core plugin, there is a H2 Kickstar script. It uh, could be something like this. Uh, so the script has a base class of um, a group script command, um, which is um, uh, automatically applied for you. You don't have to specify. But you have I it is useful for you to understand that uh, the Groovy script command class uh, provides some methods that you can call uh, if you want, like for instance, uh, the description method. Uh, or um, things like that. Uh, there is implicit variable called args, which is an array of uh, the actual arguments that has been passed to your script. 
Uh, so if I do uh, create the script foo, and then uh, uh, to run the script, the user says uh, grails foo one, two, three, then one, two, three will be the arcs of your uh, script. Uh, scripts are useful for uh, generation, code generation. Uh, and you, what you typically do is you not only create a script, but you also create a template. Uh, so for instance, if you think about the uh, create controller script, uh, there is a script for that, and there is also a template with the um, uh, default code for a controller. On the other hand, we have commands. So uh, commands are different because they are, a, mm, let's say, a full class. They implement application command, which provides access to the, uh, to the there is a get application context method available, which will give you the spring applic application context. Because uh, when Grails is going to run, your command will load the Grails application uh, first. And that's useful, for instance, if you want your, your command to interact with uh, the data source or things like that, okay? So you can grab like the, the data source bin from the Spring application context and then uh, do things there. Another thing we can do is to enhance existing artifact types. So for instance, uh, this is also new in Rails 3 because in Rails, um, in Rails 2, we were used to uh, mess up with uh, metaprogramming, uh, which um, uh, is a little bit problematic in terms of performance. Uh, so as you know, Rails 3 is um, a refactor around the traits design. Uh, so the idea is that you define a trait um, as part of your plugin, and there is a special annotation called Hansis. Uh, and you pass a list of artifact types. So it could be uh, a controller, it could be service, uh, it could be, for instance, a view. Uh, so if you think about the JSON views, uh, you could provide uh, things to a JSON view, like a methods or things like that. Uh, and it's essentially a trait, a Groovy trait. Uh, you can provide whatever methods you want, and those methods will be made available to all the artifacts that you're defining. It's really simple, uh, it's compile time, and it's very useful. Uh, the, way, mm, the way this is done, and there is a, uh, another syntax for this, uh, approach, which is a little bit more extensive, uh, but there is a, a trait injector class inside Grails that will scan uh, will scan traits with enhances annotation, right? And uh, for all of them, we'll look to which artifacts uh, they have to be applied, and they will be applied manually. When I say manually, I mean programmatically, actually. Cool. What else? Um, this is an important thing, and it's about uh, modularization. So uh, you normally uh, start with a plugin, you create a plugin, you start to add features to it, uh, and eventually you will discover you, your plugin has become a monolith. Um, so in Grails 2, it was kind of difficult to, to break plugins down into multiple pieces, uh, but with Grails 3, it's really, really easy. And I totally recommend you to break down not only plugins, but also application. Uh, you have to leverage that we're using Gradle, uh, and with Gradle, it's really simple. It's a piece of cake to uh, break uh, anything into multiple projects, so I totally recommend you to do that. Uh, so you can do this with plugins as well as with applications or any Gradle project, in fact. Because if you don't, uh, you will create a monolithic plugin. And the difference between a monolithic plugin and a multimodal plugin is the one that you have in the picture. <laughs> so um, is there anybody here that have seen this picture before? 
three, four, four people. <laughs> okay, for, for the ones that are seeing this um, for the first time, uh, this is like a, like a famous painting because uh, this probably the, my most famous uh, slide ever uh, has been retweeted like uh, millions of times uh, because people really actually like the, the comparison between uh, monolithic and uh, uh, microservices, which is with the uh, original um, picture. Just a joke. Uh, so the benefits of breaking something down into pieces is that, first of all, uh, you can bring optional dependencies. So imagine you have a plugin that brings support for uh, different uh, databases, like for instance MongoDB and, uh, I don't know, Redis, okay? Uh, it could be, uh, or even Couchbase, you have like uh, several options. So if you have a single module uh, and you uh, specify dependencies on the uh, jar client for MongoDB and also on the jar file for, for Couchbase, uh, those dependencies will be uh, fetched by the application. So the, the user will have uh, your plugin on both um, jar files when they just need one. And the only way to, to avoid that for the user will be to manually exclude one of the dependencies they don't want, right? So this is a lot of effort uh, for the user to do it. And people won't do it because they will just install the plugin and uh, they won't use any exclusion. Um, however, if you have different modules and you have like a core module plugin, which will be a core jar file, and also have a MongoDB uh, sub-module, which will be a jar file, then the user can pick the core plugin module and the MongoDB and will have only the MongoDB dependency. Uh, you also have a smaller jar files. Um, and one thing you can do is to reuse the uh, build logic. So for instance, uh, you'll have a parent build.gradle file uh, with all the common stuff uh, that are part of the build. And uh, for every so sub-module you have, you can have uh, like the specific parts, like dependencies or things like that. So how is this working? Uh, in the root of the project, uh, you have to create a settings.gradle file. Uh, the settings.gradle file will tell Gradle um, which of the folders that are, um, let's say, at that directory uh, are going to be sub-modules. So Gradle will expect, to the, uh, in this case, to be uh, to find a folder called uh, my plugin core, another one called my plugin domain, another, uh, so on and so forth. So all your modules have to be specified here. Uh, the settings.gradle file is a Groovy script, so you could uh, write something like, for instance, uh, um, for every file in this directory, uh, find all the uh, folders that start with my plugin and those are uh, included, right? So you can write Groovy code there if you want. Uh, this is more or less the root build.gradle file. Um, so uh, for the ones new to Gradle, uh, there are two things that are important to you. Um, there is the old project closure and the sub project closure. So when you have a multi-module Gradle project, uh, let's say I have, uh, for instance, two modules. If I have two modules, I have three Gradle projects. I have the root one and the sub projects ones, okay? Uh, so that's essentially the difference between all projects and sub projects. All, pl uh, all projects is applied to all of them, including the parent one. So for instance, uh, the parent project is uh, normally never going to be um, plugin or anything, it's just uh, the container for, for the other ones. So I just want to apply the idea plugin to the, to the parent one and th that's, uh, that's all. Uh, when I want to configure the specific parts for the sub plugins, I use the sub project closure. Uh, 
And what I do there is to define uh, the, for instance, the Grails version and the Grail wrapper version is something that is normally defined as part of the sort of single plugin build of Gradle file. Uh, so what I do is uh, create a, uh, when I create the, the plugin, you can actually start by uh, creating all the plugins one by one, all the modules, uh, and then you create a, a root build of Gradle file and you could and paste things like, for instance, uh, the Grails version and the Gradle wrapper version variables. Uh, the repositories can also be applied globally, like for instance, the, the Grails core uh, repository or JCenter or whatever else can be also applied for our, all the sub-projects. Uh, you will likely want to version them at the same time, so you define once the group ID for all of them and also the version. Uh, you apply the Grails plugin, Gradle plugin for all of them, and you can also have dependencies which are uh, common, like for instance, Grails core and things like that. So essentially, you put here what is common to all the build.gradles of these app modules. Uh, once you've done that, uh, the sub module build.gradle file is really simple. Actually, the dependency management block you see there can also be applied uh, in the sub-projects uh, closure. So the only thing you will have is uh, a dependencies block where you define, for instance, uh, the way you normally do that is that you define a, a core module um, which will have all the classes that should be common to the um, to the different uh, sub-projects, right? So for instance, when you have a plugin uh, with uh, multiple DB support, uh, the MongoDB uh, sub-plugin or sub-module will have the core plugin as a dependency. And because it's not a regular dependency, but it's a project dependency, that's the way you do it with the project syntax. Uh, and also, you'll have, for instance, for the MongoDB uh, plugin, the, Mon the MongoDB driver, uh, if you want. That's all. So it's four lines of code. More things you can do. Uh, for instance, you might want to aggregate the Groovy documentation, the Groovy doc. Um, the Groovy doc Gradle task is something that deserves a lot of improvement because uh, it's very uh, rudimentary. Uh, it actually runs on the same JVM, so you have a large code base you made up, made uh, ending up uh, running out of memory. Uh, and that's not the only problem it has. It doesn't have any way to aggregate all the uh, generated documentation in a single place. Uh, so you'll have to do it manually. The problem is that when you have a multi-module Gradle project and you generate the Groovy doc, uh, the resulting files will be placed on uh, different directories, right? So it will be like a bill slash module name slash uh, docs, whatever, right? Um, so this is the trick you can do to uh, generate all the uh, Java doc from different modules and put them in a single place which is in this case uh, build slash docs slash groovy doc. I will publish this in a uh, slide share, so uh, if you want to copy and paste, you will be able to do that if you want. Publishing. This is also different a uh, little bit or compared to Grails 2. Um, so how do you publish a Grails plugin? Um, it depends on the version, because uh, you know that uh, in Maven repositories, if your version ends with a snapshot, then the, uh, the repository may refuse your, your publishing uh, if you're publishing to a release repository. So uh, if you uh, well, this is also um, this is all um, considering 
that uh, they are public plugins because if it's a, like a private plugin or a corporate plugin, uh, you'll have like a corporate Nexus or Artifactory or whatever, and you will be able to publish there. But um, the settings you will see are the same. So if you have a private plugin, you can host host it in the, your corporate uh, Artifactory snapshot uh, uh, repository. Uh, but if it's a public plugin, uh, the only place where you can host snapshots is in Ojo, or whatever you call that, which is uh, uh, opensource.jfrog.org. It is an instance of uh, Artifactory from the Jfrog guys um, designed or which allows snapshot versions, okay? Uh, and there is an Artifactory Gradle plugin you can use for that. Uh, releases. So for releases, uh, there is a Gradle pub plugin publish, Gradle plugin. So it is applied to the build.gradle file. And uh, what you do is you publish them on bean tray. So bean tray uh, is essentially an Artifactory uh, under the hood is an application where you can host uh, jar files. As simple as that. So you can create uh, an account for free at beantray.com. Uh, and then the first thing you have to do is to create a repository. Uh, you create a, a repository of type Maven, uh, for instance, uh, plugins. So that will give you a repository uh, under the URL beantray.com slash username slash plugins. Okay? Uh, that's the place where you would publish your uh, your plugins. Uh, so once you've done that, uh, configuration. So for snapshots, that's the piece of code you need to uh, to put in your build.gradle file. Um, important things to to see is that when you register for uh, Ojo for open source JFrog dot org. Uh, the credentials are your bin tray username and key, okay? And actually, I don't know if it's uh, on the screenshot, but uh, it's not on this screenshot, but if you go to bintray.com and you try to manually uh, upload a, a, an, an artifact, uh, there is a, a button that says, I want my snapshot versions to be hosted uh, on Ojo. And uh, it's a check you create, and then uh, you create the account uh, after that. So uh, you provide your bin trick uh, username and key uh, in the configuration file. Uh, what you see there, actually, you see variables uh, that are not defined anywhere. So the way you would do that is, for instance, provide a uh, gradle.property files, which is not part of the bill or you put it in your uh, home directory slash dot gradle slash gradle dot properties. So you don't uh, share with uh, everybody your, your key. Um, and that's all, essentially. So there's an artifactory publish uh, section where you define, for instance, if you want to, to publish also the sources and the javadoc uh, classifiers. So that will be a snapshot version, right? Releases are done differently. Uh, why? Well, because first of all, there's a Gradle plugin, uh, which is called uh, Gradle's plugin publish, uh, that will read the information from this configuration block. What do we have here? We have a set of uh, username and passwords. So the bin tray user and bin tray key is the same as before. Uh, is uh, your bin tray credentials. And then we also have the plugin portal user and the plugin portal password. Uh, why is this here? Uh, the reason is that uh, for Grail 3 plugins, you publish uh, the plugins on bin tray. But if you remember, there is still a Grail 2 plugin portal, uh, the old one. So you might have your uh, your plugin published there. Uh, that's only for, for Grail 2 plugins, so you essentially don't care about that. 
because uh, it's only for Rails 2. But uh, a useful thing of the um, plugin portal, the old one, is that it can notify on Twitter when you publish a plugin. So if you have a, a grails.org username and password, then you put it here. Or actually, you put a variable, and then you define the variable in a Gradle properties somewhere else. Uh, the rest of the information is just to uh, generate the uh, metadata information. So uh, the repo is the plugin repo we created on Bintray. Uh, and the rest of the stuff is for the POM file generated, like, for instance, the GitHub Slack, license, title, description, developers, etc. Final thing to do uh, is in settings.gradle file, you need to define root project dot name. This is really important. This is important um, for every Gradle project. Why? Because uh, in Gradle, when you don't define this property, what happens is that the project name depends on the directory name where you're creating this. Uh, so, for instance, if uh, somebody's cloning a repo that is a Gradle uh, project uh, and they change the folder name to whatever they want and they want to publish that to a local Maven repository, uh, the, the project name will be the folder name, right? So, uh, however, if you define a root project dot name, the project name will be what you specify there, right? So there's no way for them to change. And uh, as I told you, uh, it's useful to define your credentials in uh, your home directory dot gradle slash gradle dot properties. So you will say, for instance, uh, in that file, you will say uh, bin tray user equals whatever, bin tray key equals whatever, etc. So properties file. Uh, the tasks for publishing are different because for a snapshot publishing, we're using directly the Artifactory Grill plugin. So this uh, Artifactory publish. Uh, and for release publishing, is a published plugin and notify plugin portal if you want. Those are the different tasks. So you know, one thing you can do is to uh, set up a pipeline uh, in, your, in your plugin. So in every successful build, you can publish a build snapshot to uh, a snapshot repository, right? So for instance, for the official Grails plugins and Grails core dependencies, on every single build we do this. We, we publish a build snapshot. So uh, while it's true that releases uh, are published um, from time to time, you don't actually need to wait for, a, for an actual release of uh, an official plugin or Rails to to try something because uh, uh, the master build is published as a build snapshot. So for instance, there is a 3 to 0 build snapshot version somewhere. But we haven't finished yet <laughs> because uh, once you've published your plugin uh, into with the published plugin uh, task, uh, your plugin will be available in bintray.com slash your username slash plugins repository. Okay? So your plugin will be there. Perfect. But nobody's, nobody's going to be able to find it unless you include it in the Grails repo, right? Uh, so that's the next step. Um, when you go to uh, bintray.com slash Grails, which is the organization slash plugins, there is a button that says include my package. This is the final step you have to do once. Uh, when you do that, you will send a request to us to include your plugins in the Grail slash plugins repo. And that repo is uh, automatically included for every single application. So no user will have to define any repo specifically for your plugin. But you have to make a request uh, to include it. Uh, the Grails tree plugin portal is in plugins.html. 
and the reference to the plugin portal is in the um, classical URL of uh, slash plugins, okay? So uh, when you search for a plugin and you find a URL, like for instance, rails.org slash plugins slash uh, spring security, uh, that's a Grails 2 plugin, okay? Always. The new plugins are uh, um, into the uh, plugins.html portal. Comments about testing plugins. So the approach I'm gonna recommend you uh, is using profiles. Um, the reason why I'm, ask, I'm uh, suggesting this is because uh, you could create, uh, for instance, as part of your plugin, you could create a uh, test, right? So uh, as you do with a regular, a regular application. So you, you test everything and then uh, you're fine. Uh, what kind of tests are you gonna include uh, in, in your application or in your plugin? Uh, that's normally a unit test, for instance. How did you do functional testing in a plugin? It's something difficult. Because uh, first of all, you need an application, and you need an application that is tolls your, your plugin, right? So the solution for that has been traditionally to mess around uh, bash scripts to do a create app, and then uh, have a way to manually install your plugin in that application, and then somehow copy tests to that application created and then run the tests inside the application that gets created. Uh, that's really complicated. So the approach I'm suggesting you is use a plugin, a profile for that. So your profile is like a TCK for your plugin. When you do that, uh, you don't have to mess around with bash at all because what you do is use your profile to create an application, right? And if you do that, the application created with your profile will contain your plugin installed by default. Uh, but not only that, it will also contain the tests you want. And how do you test different configuration values? Because uh, your plugin might have config uh, configuration values and you might want to to test different combinations. So I want to test this combination of uh, configuration values, run the test, and if that works, I want to try another set of configuration values. Uh, so if you follow this approach, uh, you can do that uh, using features. Um, more tricks about this because the profiles doesn't support uh, variable versions here. This is, this is a profile descriptor file, or this is actually a template. Um, because a regular profile.yaml uh, will have like a fixed version. So, but in this case, what, what we're doing is we're defining a variable there, uh, which is the plugin version. We do the same with the features. So let me go back to the profile descriptor. Uh, in this profile, what we're doing essentially is saying, all right, I want the Spring Security REST uh, plugin to be installed, plus more dependencies, like for instance, the uh, PhantomJS driver for, for uh, uh, functional tests. That's on the profile. And then for every configuration set I want to, oops, For every configuration set I want to test, uh, we can have features. Like for instance, if I want to test storing uh, information in GORM instead of MongoDB, let's say this is GORM, what I want is the Hibernate plugin. I want uh, well Hibernate dependencies and also the slash or the dash GORM module of my plugin, okay? with the variable. And then we have a simple task in our profile b.grill that will generate the profile configuration uh, YAML files based on the templates. 
So this is essentially a copy task that will replace or will span plugin version with the actual version of the project. That's all you need. The skeleton. What do you put in the skeleton of your profile? Uh, what you have to put is your functional test, right? Functional or integration test. Uh, essentially, any test annotated with add integration. Uh, and also your resources, like for instance, the configuration values you want to test, etc. Uh, so as I told you, you can use features to have different sets of uh, configurations, uh, tests, resources, etc. Uh, if you need global configuration values, uh, you can use the root skeleton folder. How do you test everything? This is a simple bash script. So for every feature of my TCK profile, what I do is I create an application with that profile. Uh, I change it into the application created and I test it. Okay, this is a way to uh, run all your test with all different kind of configurations. I have a few minutes to show you this. In an actual example. So this is the, uh, the test profile I have here. So uh, the features I have are essentially uh, different sets of configurations based on the different uh, storage support uh, the Spring Security REST has. So for instance, uh, there is support for GORM, for REST cache, for JWT, MemcacheD, etc. cetera. Um, so, well, and obviously those are the sub modules. So for instance, if I open up the uh, Gore module, this is the build of Gradle, is what I told you. So I have this block here that I could move to the parent build, I just haven't done. Uh, so I depend on the Spring Security REST uh, project, which is this, which is the core for me. And uh, that's all, I don't need anything else for this case. If I open up, for instance, the, the mencasd, uh, I have the mencasd uh, jar file client as a dependency. That's all. So this doesn't get exported. Those are the sub modules. They don't have anything special. Uh, for instance, the mencasd um, plugin has simply SSC main Groovy with the plugin descriptor here and a couple of uh, bins or classes. Uh, resources folder with uh, default configuration and uh, Grail sub empty. That's all. You don't need anything else. Uh, the profile, essentially, so if we open up, um, for instance, the mencasd, well, first of all, let me open the profile descriptor. This is what gets generated. So this is the variable version we replaced with the Gradle task. Um, that's the uh, Gradle task I, I show you in the, in the uh, on the slides. And then the features are, for instance, if we open up the mencasd one uh, This has a skeleton, and the skeleton is simply configuration values for testing mencasd storage, right? There's nothing else. Uh, and this is the feature descriptor. I just need the mencasd uh, module to be installed here. So I try all the combinations of configuration values and modules. I test them all and uh, I make sure everything is um, passing. Bang attack, thank you very much. Uh, I have a QR code which will uh, point you to a very brief survey. There's two questions. Uh, only and it's uh, valuable information for me. So if you happen to have a um, few seconds to take a, a picture of the QR code and fill the survey, I uh, will appreciate that. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending this talk and uh, thank you for being here.
Is there any question you have? I don't know if we have time. We don't, but uh, it's uh, 10 minutes to change to the other session, so maybe we'll have time for one question. So any question here? Nope, it's still too early in the morning. You need coffee? I'll be around for a while, so feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.